I'm ready to go. Are we waiting? Yeah. Hi, Gracie. Hi. Well, good day. Um, I'm here to provide a welcome to our special guests uh, who are here tonight to present uh, Intro to Métis Nation, BC, honoring the lands of the traditional territories that we live, work, and play on. I really am grateful that we have created this space tonight to hear some information and sharing from our wonderful guest speakers uh, and mentors of Métis. So welcome both Dr. Kate Elliott and Tanya Daveron. Uh, Dr. Kate Elliott is a Métis family physician who works with the Kool-Aid Community Health Center, the Victoria Native Friendship Center, and provides mobile outreach to local Aboriginal housing site. Dr. Elliott also holds the position of Minister of Women and Gender Equity and Minister of Mental Health and Addictions for First for Métis Nations, BC. Tanya Deveron is Executive Director at the Métis Nation, BC. She holds some very important roles of Ministry of Health, Mental Health and Harm Reduction, Elders and Veterans Wellness. Before we turn it over to our guest speakers, I just wanted to identify uh, some housekeeping. We have Carrie Chambers here who will be managing uh, the questions uh, that will arise and our presenters will uh, be able to accept those questions when they're ready. Uh, we also wanted to share that this webinar will be recorded for those who are un unable to attend tonight or will look forward to uh, sharing and providing and uh, creating that space of learning about Métis. Uh, so welcome both Dr. Kate Elliott and Tanya Deveron. Awesome, uh, Tanzi. Uh, thank you for having us and thank you for giving up your uh, very valuable uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, my name is Kate Elliott. I am a member of Macy Nation Greater Victoria. My family names are Lions and Guns, amongst many others. I'm uh, zooming in from the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples here in Victoria, British Columbia. I have the privilege of serving um, our uh, local urban Indigenous communities, as well as providing mobile or providing outreach to Patchadat First Nation in Port Renfrew. Um, I also work. Uh, with Kool-Aid on the mobile van, providing services to the Aboriginal Coalition to End Homelessness, um, including their um, managed alcohol program. Um, I also ha have my uh, Métis, Métis hat where I sit on our board of directors and was provincially elected to be the representative for women and gender equity, and then also hold mental health and harm reduction titles. Happy to see some familiar faces uh, on the Zoom tonight. We're really hoping to just give you an introduction of Métis 101 um, and really look forward to hearing everyone's questions, um, as well as giving some tangible tips about working uh, with our Métis citizens and some of the misconceptions on um, different re resources and supports that MNBC can have to offer. Uh, and giving some help, helpful tips going forward. Um, I'm uh, really excited to introduce Tanya Tavern. Uh, she is the most amazing matriarch and um, will take over the world one day. And I just wanted to turn it over for, to her. Um, please, let's make this interactive. Let's do some clinical examples as we go through the stuff. And I hope you guys enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, Kate. I appreciate uh, your kind words. Just pulling up my screen. Can everybody see the screen? Excellent. Uh, so just to situate myself, I am a, a proud Métis citizen living on beautiful Silks territory in the Okanagan Valley, born and raised here. And uh, it's also the chosen home of the Vernon District Métis Association, which my family started in 1996. Um, I'm a mom, I'm a daughter, I'm a wife, an aunt, and I am a sister, 
and I am uh, probably lastly introducing myself as an executive director of the nation. I am a very proud citizen of the nation and started my career in health as a registered nurse and then patient care coordinator at Vernon Jubilee Hospital. Uh, took the big leap of faith and came to work for the nation and have been here for 15 years. So uh, it's my pleasure, pleasure to share a little bit about the nation. Um, as Kate said, really hoping this is interactive. We do have an opportunity to ask questions. Please do ask questions. Uh, that's how we're going to learn when we think about what you were taught in your formal K-12 schooling about the Métis Nation. Chances are you had the opportunity to hang Louis Ariel or exonerate him, but probably didn't learn very much about the current Métis uh, population in British Columbia. So we're going to go over uh, some key terms to start. And really, these come from our uh, Kuichi Haitoyak, which is our cultural wellness book uh, that we penned and published in uh, on July 21st in 2021. So Indigenous, of course, means original inhabitants of a territory. That's language that you often hear. You'll hear First Nations and Indigenous or just Indigenous. It doesn't always include Métis. So we like the word Aboriginal because in the Constitution, it's clearly defined. It's actually defined as Indian, Inuit, and Métis in the Constitution, but it speaks to um, the Indigenous population that is in Canada. Métis is the, I'm sorry, I have to move you all, you're, you're right over my words. <laughs> uh, Métis means a person who self-identifies as Métis, is distinct from other Aboriginal peoples, and is of historic Métis Nation ancestry, and is accepted by the Métis Nation. That's a Métis National Council definition that all the four governing members have signed on to. Oh, maybe I can't move my screen now. This is... There we go. And First Nations, of course, are people who are descendants of the original inhabitants of Canada who lived here for many thousands of years before explorers arrived in Europe, from Europe. The Inuit are an Indigenous people, the majority of whom inhabit the northern regions of Canada. Inuit also refers to the family of languages of the Inuit, one of the three branches of the Eskimo Aleut language family, and is also known, especially to its speakers, as Inuktitut. So when we think about First Nations and the way that First Nations are seen in BC, we have chiefs, reserves, treaty, and status cards, and bands. Métis people are organized with a, a, a president that's elected provincially. We've got Métis settlements, script papers, where we would be able to show our family um, was handed out script. Métis Nation citizenship card, and our communities are in BC as Métis chartered communities. The term Michif has two uses. Uses, sorry. Michif languages that Métis people created and how Métis people refer to themselves in Michif. So they would say, I'm Michif, or the language is Michif. According to Stats Canada 2021, We've had an increase of about 9.4% from the 2016, uh, showing there are now 5% um, of Canadians identifying as Aboriginal. In BC, we see that roughly as one third of the Aboriginal population identifies as Métis in British Columbia. This is our Métis Nation citizenship card. And so it really speaks to how we are one of the governing members of Métis National Council. We're a self-governing nation or, or working towards self-government. Uh, we're provincially and regionally elected board of directors. Kate is a provincially elected position as the youth chair or woman's chairperson. Sorry, Kate. Uh, we also have a youth chairperson, a president and a vice president that are provincially elected and seven regions throughout the province that are uh, regionally elected elected and they are the regional directors. We have our own constitution that we adopted in 2003 and we have 40 Métis charter communities and they're all volunteer based. So our newest charter community was just actually um, sworn in last weekend um, and it's the Vancouver Sea to Sky Métis Association and we have over 25,000 Métis citizens registered with MNBC. 
Here's a map of where we are throughout the province. Um, of course, that 40th charter community is missing from this map. This is a bit of the way that Métis Nation BC is structured. So as I said, the governance arm, the bottom right, you can see there's the board of directors, and then we have seven regional councils, and within that is the Métis Charter community. So for example, in my region, the Thompson Okanagan, there are six regional, uh, sorry, six charter communities that are in that region. And then the board of directors, we have voice from the Thompson Okanagan by that regional director at the board of directors. Alongside that, we have the Métis Youth BC, Métis Women BC, Métis Veterans BC as well. And they are all part of our governance structure. To the top right, you'll see the judicial arm where we have a Senate, uh, where MNBC Senate will look at citizenship appeals and other things that are happening within the nation or really our own judicial system. To the bottom left, you'll see the business arm, Métis Provincial Council of British Columbia, whereas I'm employed through. Uh, so if you think of this sort of like uh, First Nations Health Authority, I guess, in this perspective, that yellow square would be where you see the work happening. And then the governance is, you know, Métis Nation BC. The legislative arm is really important. So as I just said, the Métis Nation Governing Assembly just happened uh, last weekend, and they do the final reading of resolutions and bills. And then the annual general meeting is the second and final reading of resolutions and bills. So if you want to bring something forward, this is a very stable government. You would bring it to the MNGA, you would require 75% of the MNGA, which is a community president from each of the charter communities and the 11 elected members of the board, 75% voting in favor. It would then move to the AGM process for ratification. That would only happen if it was something that Obviously, the majority uh, was really interested in seeing go forward. So it does create stability. It doesn't allow you to come in and stack a room uh, just to move your own agenda forward. So here's a picture of the Métis Nation BC Board of Directors. And our last annual general meeting was September 22nd to the 24th. And in the bottom square, you'll see um, the Interior Health Letter of Understanding we re-signed there with uh, Board Chair Doug Cochran, and then President Lisa Smith, and then to her left, Minister Louis de Jagger, who is the Minister of Health for Métis Nation BC. Each of our board of directors have portfolios assigned to them. So as we said, Kate has the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, as well as Women and Gender Equity. If we go from left to right in this picture, we have our CEO, Colette Trudeau. We have our Minister for the North East, Paulette Flamond, our Minister for the Northwest, Susie Hooper. Uh, the gentleman beside her is Rainy Gervais, the Minister and Regional Director for the North Central. And then to his left is Deb Fisher, and Deb Fisher is the Regional Director for the Kootenays. Then we have uh, Sean Daverin, who is the Youth Chair, Lisa Smith, our President, Walter Minot, our Vice President, uh, then we have uh, under the red infinity, Patrick Harriet, who is the regional director for Vancouver Island. Louis in the red uh, ribbon shirt, the Minister of Health from Region uh, 2, which is the Lower Mainland. And then the Thompson Okanagan regional director, Dean Gladue. And then, of course, uh, yours truly there, Dr. Kate Elliott, um, is there representing the Ministry of uh, mental health and substance use, as well as um, the Ministry of Women and Gender Equity. Any questions so far? Recognizing governance is always a bit heavy. I think one of the things is that if you were looking uh, to do a research project or looking to consult uh, within your uh, within your kind of region, the best thing would be to, to do is to reach out to Métis Nation, then reach out to the corresponding uh, community chart president. 
um, to be able to, to form uh, those relationships and do some of that consultation piece. Um, and that would be the proper, the proper protocol of who to go to. Um, that being said, if you're unsure, um, just reach out to us at MNBC and we can help direct you and do those uh, introductions and help assist you there. Our uh, regions are defined very similar um, to the health of more like the hunting regions, to be to be quite honest. Um, so we have Vancouver Island, which is region one. Uh, Lower mainland is region two. Region three would be the interior. Region four is Kootenays. Uh, then we have uh, region five, which is uh, north central. Region six, which is northwest. And then north uh, east would be region seven. Um, another question that's coming forward, can a person be a citizen of more than one nation, i.e. Manitoba and BC? Um, very uh, good and heavily politicized uh, question there. Um, quite often, it's one of those uh, tricky things. We see our people are historically very mobile and transitory. We go where the work, work is. Um, so quite often, especially with our youth, they go, go away for school and it's kind of whatever community, um, you consider home quite often people will switch between the two provinces. Uh, quite often, um, people aren't considered a, a citizen of Manitoba and BC at the same time. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, great question. So around federal commitments, we know the Truth and Reconciliation Canada's call to action, of course, there's many uh, calls to action that involve Métis Nation. The Daniels decision that occurred in 2016, which said there is a federal uh, fiduciary responsibility for Métis people. Although currently that does not translate into extended health benefits, which of course is applicable uh, to your work, Métis people, Métis citizens do not have extended health benefits from the federal government. That's something we continue to advocate for, but not something we're seeing a ton of progress in yet. We did sign the Canada Métis Nation Accord in 2017, so it is work that we hope to uh, build up under that, as well as Indigenous health legislation. We refer to the Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Report and the commitments made there, as well as the United Nations Declaration Act federally. So the tripartite agreement was recently signed in British Columbia. That is something that hasn't happened in every uh, province or territory to date. And we were very pleased to meet uh, with Minister Patty Hadou, Minister Duclos at the time in April, and have Minister Dix uh, there as well as a bit of a, a beginning tripart discussion. So we all ag agreed to the four shared priorities, First Nations Leadership and First Nations Health Authority were there as well, uh, talking about expanding access, or expanding access to family health services, uh, supporting health workers, so health human resources, quality mental health and substance use services, and really the healthcare system becoming more um, accessible through uh, data and digital tools. One of the things we will say, working with the BC College of Nurses and Midwives, we do know that of the Indigenous registrants, 50.4% identify as Métis. So there's some really great um, programs and services that we're supporting. Uh, as Kate had mentioned, um, you know, you do require your citizenship to be able to access our skills, training, employment, post-secondary uh, funding now. And that really is just churning out amazing healthcare workers. We're seeing people, you know, working on their uh, medical degrees. We're seeing people go into psychiatry. We're seeing all levels, whereas before it used to be very jobs and jobs based. I don't know how else to explain that, but it was like at the end of your four years of schooling, you needed to have a job. So about the highest you could get into would be a registered nurse or, you know, your bachelor of social work. But now we're looking at, you know, masters, NPs, we're looking at physicians. So it's a really great way of expanding um, our reach into the healthcare system and helping to be a part of that solution as opposed to um, not being able to support our citizens in pursuing uh, post-secondary. 
As far as provincial commitments go, we do have the, uh, what is the Métis Nation Relationship Accord, but that's been replaced by the BC government's letter of intent to work together. Uh, we do have the DRIPA Action Plan, of course, which goes till 2027, and it's that whole of government approach. We have a MERS sub table we just met yesterday with the Ministry of Indigenous Health and Reconciliation, the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, and the Ministry of Indigenous Rights and Reconciliation. So really, we want to continue to strengthen health and wellness partnerships. We do have letters of understanding with each and every health authority, including Provincial Health Services Authority. And in February of 2022, we released Tanche Kia, which is our Métis Public Health Surveillance Program baseline report. And Carrie is going to share that uh, with you all at the end of this uh, webinar. So when we talk about implementing Métis social determinants of health, we have the Métis Vision for Health document that we worked on across um, the Métis governing members. Provincially, we have that Tanche Kia report, which is released with the Office of the PHO. And then regionally, we talk about our interior health and we have other health authority uh, letters of understanding, which allows us to work together in a good way um, and build out our own Métis health plans within the health authorities. We were all uh, very involved in In Plain Sight. We know the commitment to addressing Indigenous-specific racism. Dr. Kate Elliott was the co-chair for Métis Nation BC, so very involved with that work. And uh, we were grateful to uh, be a part of that. Even though it did wrap up in June, there are pieces that still need to be worked on um, from In Plain Sight. And we see that transferred to the MER subtable and continuing work for our nation. We recognize that uh, Dr. Heidi Oder and uh, the College of Physicians and Surgeons um, made a pledge to be anti-racist. And this is a part of that work, I think, in doing um, some education around um, Indigenous communities in British Columbia. So as far as system-facing work goes, we talk a little bit about how we can show up in health authorities, how we can work with staff. Um, to Santi Mama Wepuak is health gathering in Michif, our language. And we were able to work with um, so far Island Health, Northern Health, Interior Health, and Fraser Health. And we're set to uh, meet with Vancouver Coastal and also with um, PHSA to do these health gatherings. Uh, the one that we just hosted on Monday at Fraser Health Authority had over 110 staff from the health authority attend and everyone is welcome. And it's just an opportunity to really do some education around the Métis population that the health authority and the staff serve. Of that work, we're doing these Métis health and wellness plans, Labway health plans that are with each and every health authority. So again, we can kind of set some targets and goals uh, to do good work together. We are part of the Health Standards Organization and the BC, the BC Cultural Safety and Humility Standard, working with HSO, FNHA, and uh, Health Quality BC on uh, anti-Indigenous racism and measuring cultural safety in the healthcare system. So what does the Métis experience look like right now for Métis people? We have two staff. Um, as part of our patient quality or health experience, we certainly don't have our own uh, PCQO, uh, which of course is the patient care quality office. Uh, we are working with our community members and creating safe places for them to land, come forward and bring their complaints from the healthcare system or their experiences or whatever they may need additional help with. So we're grateful to uh, have these staff that are now in place as part of our commitment to anti-Indigenous racism, working alongside the health authority and speaking about um, where there have per been persistent health barriers for Métis people. This particular example is from Fraser Health Authority and their patient care quality office um, and the information they've collected in the last two years uh, that was shared with us. So we're appreciative of, of gathering this information and learning more about uh, the Métis experience. So we always wanna remember that each person has a story and tragically it doesn't always 
become just numbers. So on August 31st, um, which was, of course, International Overdose Awareness Day, we centered around recognizing those people who go unseen. And Naomi was one of those people who became a number. So Naomi was not just a number. She was a face. She was a person. Uh, to Naomi, we continue. And to those that we continue to lose, we see that we see you. Métis Nation BC has consistently called for action to improve mental health and wellness for Métis in BC. The continued loss of life due to culturally unsafe health and wellness services in BC um, is unacceptable and it has a devastating impact on our communities. MNBC will continue to work and develop relationships with health, health partners to promote a distinctions-based or Métis-specific approach to mental health and wellness services and begin the journey of healing, journey of healing within our Métis communities. There is a commitment through the pathway um, to hope from the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions. And we've had verbal commitments from Deputy Minister Stephen Brown around really elevating and speaking to trauma-informed uh, Métis specific mental health and substance use um, services and really acknowledging that one size does not fit all. I think sometimes the problem with Indigenous services is that it may work for First Nations people. It may not. It may not work for all First Nations people, but really being more specific to um, understanding and, and being able to really um, see that person's journey and be able to receive them in the way they want to be received. And part of that is the educational piece, I think, where people think one, one Indigenous person is the same as another Indigenous person. And we know working with um, our colleagues and friends at First Nations Health Authority, there is so much difference between us. Um, so many things we share, shared histories, residential school, day schools, um, but a difference in the way we want to be seen and show up in healthcare today. This is some pictures from uh, Tasanti Mamawepuak in uh, Island Health that we were happy to uh, to host. And also uh, the bottom left is uh, from Northern Health. We had a, but a huge gathering there. It was really wonderful. This is one of the ways, as Kate had spoken about, how we connect into our community. So we have regional health coordinators in each of each of the uh, larger regions. So Northern BC, recognizing that's three regions for us, Lower Mainland, Vancouver Island, and Interior Kootenays. And these staff have that connection to community. So really, it's a great opportunity to work with them um, and really understand um, the community that you're serving. Um, I know Kate spoke to research earlier and there's lots of opportunities to connect in um, as we're beginning to do more and more work in that area. 467 unique health requests were received from October 22nd to August uh, amongst four staff. So we know there's a need and these regional health coordinators um, are really, really accessible and are so... Um, I would say creative, adaptive. They are finding ways to meet the needs of Métis people, going through everything from like rotary to, you know, what does the health authority provide and becoming advocates for people in their healthcare experience. Recognizing, as I said before, there are no extended health benefits for Métis people. So sometimes we're piecing things together. We talk about medical transportation, like hope air. How do we access that? How do we repatriate patients? When we bring someone down from Chetwind and they have open heart surgery at St. Paul's and they're discharged, how do they get back home? Those things I think we don't really have good processes for right now. And those are where we see our regional health coordinators become such a strength and such a valuable addition to uh, Métis Nation BC. So I spoke a little bit earlier about the vision for health, that national paper, health being a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. It's a state of balance and interconnectedness, Relationships between physical, mental, emotional, social, financial, economic, spiritual, environmental, and cultural well-being. 17 social determinants of health are the Métis social determinants of health. 
And it's to that extent in which Métis people, families, or communities can achieve individual or collective well-being now and for future generations. Just wanted to touch base on the report that will be shared with you later. Tanche Kia, which is our ongoing commitment to the um, the health and well-being of Métis people, our citizens in this province. So I mentioned we have 25,000 citizens and about 7% of our community has chosen to opt out of being a part of our Métis, used to be called population health surveillance program. So we've changed that language. We thought surveillance maybe wasn't uh, what Métis people wanted to hear. So now it's the Métis population health program. And we're really working around um, Métis people feeling secure, knowing it's population health information that's being shared. So sharing this report very widely has helped them not to see themselves in it, of course, because I think there's a constant fear about people knowing too much about you. Um, as we've said to everyone that's asked questions about this program, the province of BC knows everything about you. They know if they broke your arm when you were nine, they know, you know, you had a C-section with your second child. The only thing they don't know is that you're a citizen of Métis Nation BC. So this has been our way of creating an opportunity to work directly with the province and have citizenship information that uh, we can set that baseline and start targets and uh, indicators for um, our three periods or our three reports that we'll be releasing this decade. Um, and, you know, this is from the province, especially the OPHO. They see it as a true and lasting opportunity for reconciliation. They see distinctions-based approaches. They talk about the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, TRC, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. Of course, our MNBC and BC Government Letter of Intent. And the PHO's responsing, reporting responsibilities under the Public Health Act. We know that cultural connectedness and recognition of Métis identity are linked to improved health outcomes for Métis people. These two reports are from uh, the Adolescent Health Survey, which is done every five years um, in the school system for grades 8 through 12. So 12 to 19-year-olds can self-declare um, as part of that 130 paper and uh, pencil survey how they're doing that particular day. So of the uh, students that identify as Indigenous, 33% identified as Métis. And when you look at some of the stats that are coming out of here that are shared in Tanche Kia, we recognize that youth mental health and wellness is not as great as it should be, especially for our Métis population. Um, so we see youth that are rating their mental health as good or excellent, being lower than non-Métis youth. And youth who rated their mental health as good or excellent uh, being worse for Métis females compared to Métis males. I know when we, um, numbers that stick in my head all the time, we talk about cutting or intentionally harming. Uh, we saw in the 2013 report that 27% of Métis girls ages 12 to 19 were intentionally cutting or harming. In the 20, um, or sorry, that was 2008. In 2013, that number went to 36%. In 2018, girls aged 12 to 19 were intentionally cutting or harming at 42%. And we know this is post or pre-COVID. So the 2023 Adolescent Health Survey um, has occurred and we wait for the report where we will report out on Métis um, boys and girls and non-binary youth and their mental health and wellness and what it looks like post-COVID. This is one of the best indicators of how youth are doing when we look at how they are reporting, um, self-reporting out on their own. It's um, administered, uh, has been administered since 1996, and it's in um, almost all of the school districts. I think there might be one or two that they no longer um, are participating in. But it certainly is a, a very interesting read if you have an, an opportunity to look at McCreary Center's um, reports. So we know that Métis youth who report participating in traditional or cultural activities are more likely to volunteer and we're more likely to feel connected to their communities. And those that feel connected have reporting out on good or excellent mental health and that they're managing their stress well. 
We know that Métis people's health continues to be harmed by the cumulative impacts of systemic racism, colonization, and social exclusion, and it's reflected in higher rates of chronic conditions such as diabetes, respiratory illnesses like COPD and asthma, and mental health concerns are more common amongst the Métis, especially younger females and non-binary youth. So here we see uh, diabetes, and we recognize uh, other residents being other um, other residents of BC, including First Nation status, non-status, and non-Indigenous people, as well as Métis people that self-identify and were not part of the cohort. So we see, um, you know, uh, diabetes being much higher than other residents. We know that Métis people are more likely to suffer from COPD and asthma is much higher as well. So when we talk about um, the mental and emotional health of Métis and non-Métis versus or against Métis and non-Métis youth, we see those differences as well around um, anxiety, panic attacks, depression, um, considering suicide and self-harming. And we know that culture builds resilience. And so we just um, have received funding from the province of BC to do Métis culture camps for girls that we're very excited to do um, during spring break uh, this year, building more resilience. We know as uh, young girls age into women, we see this now reflected in women in mood and anxiety disorder. So this is 18 and up where we see 20.7% of females compared to 15.3% of other residents um, with age standardized mood and anxiety disorders. This is some of our good news stories. And so we talk about what can we do? We find money where out of administration, we find opportunities to serve our community, recognizing there's such a need. And so this is a really nice story about um, somebody's grandchild that attended a 12-step program. We don't choose people's programs. If you want to do abstinence or harm reduction, that's completely up to do, up to um, the person. And uh, this, this grandson's doing very well today. And this was in uh, July. So is now still um, doing very well, according to family. And we're so pleased that we were able to provide supports for this young man. Here's somebody we know, Dr. Kate Elliott, um, the digital program lifeguard. Uh, we launched lifeguard app with a Métis, um, face to it. So people could download the digital lifeguard app and be able to be provided with additional additional mental health and substance use services, um, counseling, and other opportunities to connect with our regional mental health navigators and Mionan um, wellness workers. So we have uh, two social workers on staff, and we don't want to call them social workers. So they are Mionan, uh, which means wellness in Michif. And those social workers um, help support people on their journey. Um, and we have a substance use and addictions program where we have peer uh, peer workers out in downtown Eastside, as well as Surrey now, um, helping support our community members that are more vulnerable. The Métis Counseling Connection Program is uh, one of our, our flagships where we really have um, stepped up to meet the needs of Métis community members. So citizens can um, apply to be a part of our Métis Counseling Connect, and they are then um, qualified for 10 counseling sessions with a counselor of their choice, um, which has been really wonderful because we all know sometimes you get matched with a counselor or a clinician and it's not a good fit. So they're not committed to stay in that relationship if it's not a fit. We have identified many, many, many Métis clinicians that want to work with our community. And we promote them, of course, as clinicians of choice. Um, those that have various experience with working with PTSD, uh, those that are residential school survivors and helping to connect um, intergenerational survivors as well, and just that trauma. Um, so really a trauma-informed practice 
and uh, something that um, prevents any barriers. We pay the service provider directly. So they invoice Métis Nation BC. Um, so we know that many of your clients don't have $175 in their pocket to pay, get reimbursed. Um, or, you know, they do their six save free sessions at a local um, place where maybe they really made a connection with that clinician and then we can pay for 10 sessions um, with that clinician. So there's a lot of um, opportunity there to work um, with with Métis citizens and with physicians, those that are prescribing and want to make connection to uh, counseling services that go above and beyond what's maybe available to your clients. Right now, Métis Counseling Connect is serving um, females and males. Look at that. I think it's amazing to see 30% of our clients being served by Métis Counseling Connection, um, 30% of them being males. We have not done a good job of tracking non-binary to spirit and those that identify as asexual and other. So it's something we're working on uh, moving forward because, you know, when we look at stats, we know very much just like, you know, the province, male, female, there's no non-binary, there's no middle. Um, so the gendered uh, piece is something we are working on, but it's it's really lovely to see that 30% of our males are reaching out. We know that 13% of those that are receiving counseling are over the age of 60 and 30% are under the age of 30. So when we talk about boys, girls, young people that need this counseling, it's barrier free. They literally email in, they get on the list, we connect them to the clinician and we help start paying um, and making those connections for them. This is by far one of our most successful programs and we're learning as we go because obviously, um, you know, intake, you're sort of building programs as you go. And uh, we're so excited to uh, make you aware of this program because we know it's saving lives. Uh, these are two other resources. So we talked about Kawichi Aitoyak um, at the beginning around definitions. And this is the uh, book that we released in uh, on National Indigenous Peoples Day in 2022, uh, Métis Perspectives on Cultural Wellness. And it really is an opportunity to learn more about the Métis Nation in BC um, and to talk about what does cultural, what does it mean to be culturally well? We hear cultural safety all the time. I don't think we're going to ever get to safety, but we can be well in our choices and we can think about the person as a whole. We are working with uh, the Kuhis Crisis Services to offer Métis Crisis Line as well. So we've set up a line, one eight three three Métis BC, where people can call in 24 hours a day, seven days a week and learn more about programs and services. So when we think about the Métis Counseling Connect, Métis Crisis Line is aware of that. And they can say, you know, I can help you with X, Y, Z today, but please connect into Métis Counseling Connect if you are a citizen and we'll make sure you get uh, registered to be able to access the uh, 10 sessions. And that is the end of my presentation because we're really hoping there's some opportunity for dialogue. I think, uh, Kate, earlier when you spoke about research opportunities and the way that we um, are stewards of our own information right now, we have a Métis Data Governance Committee. So we have the opportunity for research proposals to come through for our Métis Data Governance Committee to really look at it and see the value and help you along um, your journey of research, if that is your um your desire this evening and certainly here to work with Kate to answer any questions you may have. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Thank you so much for that, Tanya. Uh, we did have one in the chat that Kate actually um, answered earlier, but perhaps uh, you could go into a little bit more detail about how citizenship is defined. Um, so cis Citizenship is defined um, by our national organization, uh, Métis National Council, as well as it's the accepted um, definition for Métis based on the Pauli Agreement and some of our legislation. 
So first you need to self-identify as Métis, um, uh, which is kind of a loaded thing. Like you need to be Métis is not an accessory that you can take on and off as, as you will, or um, whether it's advantageous or not, it really has to do with the self um, reflection values um, and lived experience. The second piece is having um, ge or genealogic ties to our historic Métis communities. Um, traditionally that is around the Red River uh, Prairie provinces. And then the third piece is that you have to have accept uh, um, ties and community acceptance to a modern day Métis community now. Um, so people who are not Métis nation citizens, can they access programs mentioned? Um, so there are lots of barriers to citizenship. I don't want to tell you, but I know there's people in this chat room who feel like, oh my goodness, how long did I go to school for? The paperwork is hard. It is tricky. Sometimes it involves tracking down baptismal records from like 150 years ago. Um, it can be pretty, pretty challenging. Um, where we really see this is our kids in care, where, you know, our genealogists, our, our elders and stuff, like, like they know, but there's lots of barriers in trying and accessing that. Um, most of our services, um, kind of depending on, on need, if you self-identify uh, as Métis, um, we won't withdraw services, but then there's an expectation that uh, you work with our citizenship res our, um, registry to be able to fill in those pieces. Um, there are very few things that we require the citizenship card for, um, but for the most part, it's not um, an explicit uh, barrier to that. I think um, one of the, the important pieces is if you guys are asking if people are Indigenous, what does, what does that mean? Is it First Nations, Métis, uh, Inuit? Um, really important when you're asking that information. Why are you asking and what you're going to do, do with it? We're seeing a lot of the health authorities now asking people to self-identify, um, especially me, Team BC. Um, we have remained hidden and, in, and invisible for quite a long time. And that was at a survival. That's how our kids were able to stay with their families. Um, you know, we're Jewish, we're Italian everything. So it's really kind of within the last 10, 15 years where we've seen people really come out. And I think that's where a lot of the uptake in their numbers are. Um, but there's still a lot of um, fear and um, can trigger some fight or flight in patients. Um, racism is very much alive in our healthcare system. So I know uh, meeting with our elders or community members, um, providing some of that um, educational like reciprocity um, can go a long way of, well, why would you like to know? Oh, we're going to use this to be able to help support, to support you or help for, re to help you point to the right resources. Um, you know, for a lot of people, it might be something they share later on with you and not right, right off the bat. Um, but having uh, basic conversations of like, what community do you belong from? Where are you from? It goes so far, so far, but also will give you that understanding of not making the assumption that, oh, well, I can write you a prescription for Tylenol and it's covered. Or, you know, your walker's gonna be covered or all these different things. Um, we are starting to see a, a, a shift into that distinctions-based approach. Um, but quite often, or people don't feel safe when it's just, you know, Indigenous services. Well, is that for me? Do I look Indigenous enough? Do I belong there? Um, Métis people, especially our women, oh, we're proud and we're so stubborn. Um, and, you know, I think when we ask for help, it's a huge thing. It's like, stop what you're doing, shut the front door. Oh my goodness, right? And then if um, 
you send them to, oh, we'll just call First Nations Health Authority, um, psychiatrists of the day. That's slamming a huge door and it could really uh, jeopardize your therapeutic relationships that you've been working really hard with your patients. Um, one of our... Sorry, sorry oh, to one. jump in. Um, oh, while you're speaking of, of these services and health, um, I'm wondering, uh, and with Tan what Tanya was saying earlier about uh, that you guys have these health coordinators across yeah. the province, um, are those coordinators and services listed on Pathways BC, which is um, someone can probably do a better job than me of explaining it, but it is. That, a, I don't believe they are, but that would be a great thing to have yeah. in this, like an action item from this meeting. And I'm sorry, I'm going on a tangent model blog. No, I just wanted to yeah. catch you before you, while you were talking about the services, because mm -hmm. there's even pathways for community now. So yeah. community members can access the pathways site and find healthcare providers in their region specific to what they're looking for mm -hmm. um and it sounds like the services you guys are providing are, are very valuable and we don't have a lot we don't have a lot but like holy moly do we have a lot more than we did two years ago five years ago ten ten years ago um but we are definitely a, a place that can help navigate I don't think um it's a reasonable expectations for our providers to know all the different services um, or um, know some of the the intricacies and it's okay not to know sometimes patients will know it's like hey like if I write you a prescription would this be co covered regarding right. some of the the plan w benefits and things but a good place to start is always uh, contacting MMBC and we can help find the information Great. I'm sorry, my babies are screaming in the I back. I know, I hear them. <laughs> they're, they're like, wish us happy birthday tomorrow. They're I know. twins. Um, I, I just wanted to add, Kate, I think, you know, really around building that relationship and that um, the way that people feel that care is safe is even if you have that knowledge of what community do you belong to, as opposed to saying, what band do you belong to? Because instantly, you know, there's that, that unsafety that happens. You're like, oh, now you're like, oh, maybe I can't access the service because I don't have extended health benefits. I'm not a part of First Nations health benefits. Um, so, you know, in, in the chat, and I will look into this Pathways BC 100%. Thank you, Carrie, because we want to share this knowledge and we just made it as easy as we could. So health at mnbc.ca. If you have a client and you're like, I have so-and-so in Souk, who, do, who could I connect them to? And this is our health administration team, and they will help make that connection directly to, uh, on the island, Yvonne Hussein for, um, for regional health coordinator and for mental health navigator, Carly Boersboom. So we've got, you know, we've got those people and they know the resources, they know what they can access and they can really help make, um, you know, even Bosley's offers free pet food if you make the right connections, right? These are the connections they've found. So when people are suffering, when people, you know, are just having a really rough time suffering with their mental health and wellness, many, many, many of our citizens and our community members are, are definitely there as we know. And we know the cost, we know the cost of antidepressants. It just makes you more depressed really, unless it's covered. Um, so just finding ways to navigate and um, opportunities to connect them to community, connect them back to Métis Nation BC so that we can help support them as well. Because we know that cultural piece is a part of the healing. Culture is medicine. Um, thank you. Um, Gloria, you have your hand up. Good evening, everyone. Very uh, happy to uh, join you all tonight. Uh, my name is Gloria, and I'm the um, Indigenous Relations Manager with the Nanaimo Division of Family Practice, and I'm a Métis citizen with MNBC. 
And, you know, I, I can speak from, from uh, personal and professional experience that the racism as a Métis person I've experienced in the health system has a lot to do with people questioning my identity and saying, well, you know, um, because I'm not dark skinned, I, I don't look indigenous and that kind of thing. And then also, um, assuming that I'm non-Indigenous and then once finding out I am, I get treated differently. And that's how it happened to me in emergency services at the hospital uh, and different places. So, you know, I hear I hear a lot of these stories and and I think that that one of the things that, you know, as a Métis professional woman that I would like everyone in this room to know is is the trauma that our people have gone through that is is no less than First Nations people because we were in the 60s scoop. We were in the residential schools. My mother was in Gerard Mission Residential School in Alberta. I was in a daycare, like a, a daycare situation that really involved a lot of abuse because they knew who my mother was when I was a child. And I remember that. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, knowing the history and knowing how we were just chased out of our land and our homeland is the Red River settlement in Manitoba and we were scripted out and thrown on the road. So there's been, you know, the loss of identity, the loss of land the loss of our language to survive. You know, you said it earlier, Tanya, that we've just adapted all these different identities. And you were talking about that, Kate, you know, I'm Italian, I'm you, what have you, in order to survive. And then having to, to adapt to white privilege in order to feel like I, I'm, you know, I'm worth anything. So, you know, that that's what I want people to know is, is that that's how racism impacts our people. And, and sometimes it's worse, you know, and, and you wouldn't think that. You would think, well, you know, First Nations people have it bad. You know, they have it the worst. I would say we have it about the same. It's just different, you know, but racism is racism. And it isn't, there is systemic racism in the healthcare system. There's no doubt about it. Um, I really appreciate what you had to say today. And, and thank you for speaking for our people. You know, we need to have a voice and, and I'm, I'm glad that you're here. And I just want to say I'm very proud to be a Métis citizen and to know my identity and know who I am and know who my ancestors were. Um, I also, um, my family eventually settled from Red River in Peavine Settlement in Alberta. So I, you know, have a, I'm lucky enough to have that kind of a community. A lot of our people don't. You know, they, they um, have just had to live wherever they could find a place to live. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for sharing, Gloria. I really appreciate that. And I, and I appreciate the um, the identity conversation uh, because, you know, people look at you, they, they're they like probably making the assumption that you're non-Indigenous and yet you've just shared your residential school um, impacts in your family. Same with mm -hmm. myself. My grandfather went to Fort Capel. I can speak mm -hmm. as a First Nations person who has that equal trauma sewn through their family. And because we present differently, we're treated differently when we talk about it. So um, I really appreciate you bringing that lens forward. Yeah. And the, and the big thing about healthcare is the impact of the Indian hospitals. And my uncle had TB and he was in the Indian hospital in Edmonton. So we weren't spared that either just wanted to share that. That's uh, so much, Gloria. Are we done now? Uh, there, that brings questions. us to our time. Um, did anyone else have any questions that they wanted to ask Tanya or Kate or... Um, Maybe you two wanted to make a little plug for our February uh, session that we we just set in stone yesterday. <laughs> Tanya, you're muted. Of course, I I actually realized I just put my email um, 
in the chat, but I'm going on holidays as a Friday. <laughs> so probably not the most useful. Again, I would lean back into that help at mnvc.ca and we can move your inquiry wherever it needs to go. Uh, yes, we're very excited. February 28th, Wednesday, I believe it is, uh, to do a panel around mental health and substance use. We'll have Dr. Kate Elliott, as well as a couple other Métis physicians that we're working with, uh, be a part of that panel for more of a question answer uh, period and really hope to have you all rejoin us and learn more about uh, Métis Nation BC. Thanks for spending your evening with us and recognizing we've gone over time. Thank you. Uh, Britt has also put the sessional form link in the chat, but we will be sending out an email tomorrow that you will all receive with that attached as well. Thanks. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.